Welcome to today's seminar with uh, Joanna Ochremiak uh, from CNRS and Labri in Bordeaux. So Joanna is working in logic, uh, but I think also interested in, in, in somehow the intersection of logic and algorithms and complexity and how to apply uh, logic to derive interesting facts in algorithms and complexity, I think. Uh, I'm sure Joanna will explain more. And today we're having the pleasure of hearing her a tutorial style talk on how logic and finite model theory can be useful for proof complexity. So without further ado, Joanna, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thanks uh, everybody for coming. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about uh, proof complexity and finite model theory. I think that uh, most of you know what proof complexity is. So maybe just uh, one sentence about uh, what finite model theory is. So it's the study of the expressive power of logics on the class of all finite structures. And today I want to talk about uh, surprisingly tight connections between finite model theory and proof complexity. And actually, and I will focus on, uh, on introducing some tools for proving lower bounds in proof complexity by translating some no lower bounds from finite model theory. Um, yeah, so I think that all the organizational uh, stuff has already been discussed. So it's going to be a two, 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 hour, two hours long tutorial. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, the key thing, uh, the key message of, of, this, of this talk is that uh, I want to explain to you the following strategy for proving lower bounds. So first we show that proof search uh, for certain proof system X that we are interested in is expressible in some logic L and then we use existing lower bounds uh, for L. So this is what we are gonna discuss today and, uh, and this is the plan. So first I will give you a, an introduction on finite model theory. So we are gonna uh, introduce some fixed point logics and talk a bit about uh, how lower bounds are proved in logic. And then we are gonna move uh, to expressibility of proof search. So this is, uh, I mean, this is the, the, the main uh, technical part of my talk. So here I want to talk about, uh, I mean, briefly discuss resolution and then focus on uh, how to prove expressibility of proof search for Shirley Adams and sum of squares uh, in certain logics that uh, we're gonna hear about uh, in the first part. And finally, we will have uh, we'll have a, like a, I will mention briefly uh, a few applications of this of those techniques. So I think I will I will I mean um, a natural place to make a break is somewhere here. So I guess uh, yeah we're gonna have a five minutes break uh, in between those two. Uh, I mean in between the first and second part. Okay, so uh, so that's it. And as Jakob said, uh, please interrupt me and ask questions if uh, if you have any questions. Okay, so before we start this finite model theory uh, part, uh, the key definition, which uh, probably you all know, but uh, let's remind it anywhere. anyway. So I will be talking about expressive power of logics on finite relational structures. So a finite relational structure is a finite universe or domain and a bunch of uh, relations. So sets of tuples of elements of the structure. And an example that, uh, I mean, in the first part of the talk, I will be mostly talking actually about graphs. So a graph is a relational structure. And the, the domain is the set of vertices and the, the relation is, is just a set of edges, so a binary relation. Okay, so to organize a bit uh, this first part and give you a bit of a finite model theory perspective and somehow a context in which the logics that I will discuss arise in finite model theory. I want to mention this uh, important uh, open question uh, in finite model theory or descriptive complexity. So question whether there is a logic which captures exactly the p-time p -time properties of structures. So, uh, I mean, there are of course some subtleties to this question. In particular, there is a, a quite complication definition or a quite, quite complicated definition of what a logic is. But uh, I mean, uh, let's not uh, get into those details. Uh, so this question asks about the logic such that for every sentence of this logic, testing whether an input structure satisfies this sentence, sentence is in p-time. And this is, for instance, true for first order logic. So if we write some, I mean, this is, this is a trivial uh, 
thing that you can write in first order logic, but anything that you write in first order logic, you can verify in polynomial time. Uh, and the second thing that we want is that every property that is very that can be verified in polynomial time can be expressed in the logic. So this is uh, this is in particular true for second order logic, but uh, second order logic is much too expressive. Uh, to I mean, we can express much more than p-time properties in second-order logic. So yeah, just so a, we want something. Yes. Just a first naive question: When we're talking about verifying things in in polynomial time, so I should think of the structure as like the the relations are somehow fixed, and what varies is is the the size of the universe and how these relations are like interpreted, which relations hold on which elements. Yes, so you have, I mean, in, in, you can think uh, you have a you have a signature which is fixed. So, for instance, you are talking about graphs. You have just a single uh, binary relation, and uh, yeah, and then you you I mean, an input is a concrete graph, but uh, that you can have any graph as an input and and, and nothing else. So you, you consider the signature to be fixed. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, okay, and now so so then we have those two examples of logic that satisfy I mean logic that satisfy uh, the property one and logic that satisfy the property two, but uh, we want a logic which would satisfy both uh, at the same time. So to give you an example of uh, of uh, I mean to, to to show you that this kind of result is possible, I just want to mention this uh, this uh, theorem by Fagin from 74, so he showed that existential, uh, existential second order logic exactly captures uh, problems in NP. So uh, just, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna define the sec uh, uh, existential second order logic, but this is, uh, I mean, an example uh, proper, I mean, an example formula of this logic that expresses the fact that graph is three color cor colorable. So we say that there exists R, B, and G, where R, B, and G are sets of vertices. So in general, we can quantify over sets of pairs of vertices, sets of triples of vertices, etc. So this is the second order part. So there exists uh, sets R, B, and G. So those are the colors such that, and then we have a first order formula, like arbitrary first order formula. So in this case, this is a formula which says that every vertex has some color. And if we have an edge, then the the, the vertices that belongs to this edge cannot have the same color. So indeed, this this defines a graph three colorability. Okay, so the first logic uh, that is important in the in the context of this question is uh, fixed point logic. So there is actually several uh, several uh, equivalent uh, ways we can define it, but uh, I mean. I'm not gonna define it in, in really in detail, but I want to give you an example of a formula. Uh, which is which is definable in this logic. So this is a first order logic together with some mechanism for iteration. So here is an example of a formula which expresses transitive, which defines transitive closure of an edge relation. So, I mean, a fixed point formula, which uh, says that X and Y belong to the relation. If there is an edge between them or whether there exists a Z such that and then uh, here, this means that uh, X and Z belong to the previous step of the iteration, and there is a step between Z and Y. So more precisely, this formula defines a sequence of relations. The first one is empty. And then in the relation N plus one, we put those tuples X and Y, such that either there is an edge between X and Y, or there is a, there exists Z such that X and Z belong to the previous iteration, I mean, the previous step, the, the relation Xn, and there is an edge between Z and Y. So it's easy to see that uh, the relation Xn contains all pairs of vertices X and Y such that Y is reachable from X by a path of length at most N. And now this formula actually, so this uh, this fixed point formula defines the least fixed point of this uh, sequence of uh, of relations. So at, at some point this will stabilize and this will be indeed, this way indeed we will define the transitive closure of the edge relation E. So in general, we can, uh, I mean, you kind of see the, see the pattern. So we can define this kind of uh, fixed point, uh, fixed point uh, uh, formulas and we add them to the logic. And this is how we define the fixed point logic. 
So first of all, fixed point logic, I mean, every property that can be written as a fixed point, uh, as, a, as a formula of this logic can be verified in polynomial time. Uh, so I think this is intuitively clear. Uh, and uh, importantly, so this will be important for our, uh, when we will be implementing the proof search for Shirley Adams and sum of squares in logic, then this, this will be a very important thing. So fixed point logic captures polynomial time on ordered structures. So if your structure that you, if, if one of the relation in the structure that, you, uh, that you're thinking about is a binary relation, which is an, a linear order on the domain of the structure, then every p-time property can be expressed in fixed point logic. Uh, and this was showed uh, independently by- So I have a quick by... question. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So when we define the fixed point operator, are we required for this um, iteration to somehow be monotone? Yes, yes. So this, okay. this, uh, this formula, wherever you write, whenever you write this formula, then uh, what you write here, it has to be, uh, it has to be a positive, uh, yeah, it has to be a positive formula. So I mean, uh, this in particular, this will be a monotone operator, and uh, so the fixed point will be well defined. Although there is uh, uh, there is another way of defining it, which uh, I mean, it's, it's it requires a proof that, but it can be, I mean, it can be showed that you can also uh, talk about something which is like which is called inflationary fixed point. So you basically in the in the next step, next iteration step, you define the relation which is a sum of previous step and what you define now, and and uh, yeah, it turns out to be to be the same. Uh, both over finite structures and actually over infinite structures as well. But this is a very good point. It's it's the, this operator has to be monotone. Okay, so uh, yeah, so Imerman and Vardy showed that if our or our structures is our structure is ordered, then fixed point logic captures uh, all like everything that we can do in p time. We can also define in in fixed point logic. But on the other hand, uh, there are very uh, simple p-time properties, which in general are not defined, uh, not definable in fixed point logic. So for example, I mean, we are not gonna show it, but it's not very difficult to show that the fact that uh, the domain of a structure has even number of elements cannot be defined in general in fixed point logic. It can if we have order, but it cannot, it cannot in general. Okay, so, um, Kind of so. So in general, it has been observed that the properties, uh, the p-time properties that are not definable in fixed point logic, are quite often the ones which have to do with counting. So, for instance, this evenness. So this is why in this paper, uh, uh, where Imer, uh, I mean, one of the two papers that showed that fixed point logic uh, captures p-time over ordered structures. So the one by Imerman. Imerman proposed another logic, which was supposed to be a candidate for logic that could capture polynomial time. And this is fixed point logic with counting. So yeah, so what, so since we are missing, uh, since we are missing counting, let's add the mechanism for counting to our logic. So here we have an example of a formula which expresses even like the fact that the structure has even number of elements in fixed point logic with counting. So we say that there exists two elements n and m, but this time this existential quantification is not over the domain of the structure on which we evaluate this formula. It is over the, the, the an ordered domain. So I will, I mean, I will give you a precise definition, but basically when we evaluate a fixed point with counting formula, we think about, uh, we think about uh, two, uh, I mean, two, two kinds of domains, the domain of the original structure and a separate domain of, uh, I mean, orders, ordered domain of size. Uh, well, I mean, it has one more element than the domain of the structure so that we can express zero. So there exists two elements of this ordered domain such that N is the, and here we are talking about elements of, uh, of our, our original structure. So N is the number of, of X's such that X equals X. So n is basically the number of elements of A, and m plus m equals n. So this is, uh, I mean, uh, this looks like a function, but actually this is this, we encode this as a 
relations. So on, on the ordered domain, we have the plus relation. So all triples which such that uh, this plus this equals this belong to this, uh, to this addition relation. And this way, I mean, yeah, we express the fact that n is actually the number of elements of A and n is, is an even number. So this is an example. And here we have, uh, we have a, a definition of the logic. So as I said, it has in this logic, we have two sorts of variables. The first, I mean, the variables, uh, the like, kind of standard variables, which range over the elements of the structure. So such that X, such, such as X in, the, in our last example, and another uh, and, and a different sort of variables, which range over this ordered domain, 0, 1, et cetera, up to, up to the number of elements of A. We have ternary, ah, I forgot about one thing. So we have ternary relations plus and times on this number domain, but more, more importantly, this number domain is ordered. So we also have a binary order relation on this. So since we want to interpret, interpret elements of this domain as, as numbers from zero, 0 to the number of elements of A, we need an order to actually know that those are consecutive numbers. So there is a binary order that I forgot about here. We can, uh, so we can also, we can use, uh, use those relations in addition to the relations of the original structure. And we have uh, counting terms, which define the number of elements of our structure, which satisfies some formula. And of course we have fixed point formulas such that, I mean, the same as we had uh, before, because I mean, we, we, we enrich the fixed point logic by this counting mechanism. Uh, so I hope this is, this is more or less clear. Sorry for forgetting the order relation. Uh, Ordered. Okay, good. Um, okay, so so this was so actually so fixed point lo fixed point logic was never really considered as a candidate for logic for for polynomial time. This logic was actually a serious candidate for logic that could capture polynomial time for a while. So in particular, it's kind of clear that uh, that it's like every property that can be expressed in this logic is a p time property. Um, but it turned out, uh, I mean, uh, kind of uh, 10 years, uh, 10 years later that there are P time properties of graphs, uh, which are not expressible in this big point logic with counting. So this is actually, I mean, this is, this is, uh, so this theorem will be also very important for us in the second half, because, uh, this, this theorem gives us, uh, the, the lower bound in, uh, I mean, the, basically the lower bound that I will, that will be important for me that I will try to translate to proof complexity from finite model theory. Uh, so this property that they showed not to be expressible in polynomial time is the graph isomorphism problem for graphs of degree three. So uh, we can decide graph isomorphism for graphs of bounded degree. Uh, this was uh, shown by Lux in 82. And uh, and uh, Seifurel and Immermann showed that this property is not expressible in fixed point logic with counting. Joanna? Yes. Hi. Uh, I, I have a question. So um, you said that uh, fixed point, uh, sorry, with uh, it's sufficient with uh, an ordered structure. Mm -hmm. But if we have counting, uh, I mean, intuitively, if uh, if we have counting, can why can't we? or the, the structure using the counter? Is that because like... The thing is that, yeah, this is, this is a very good question. So basically, so you, in some sense, you do have order, but this order is completely disjoint from the, from the structure itself. Mm -hmm. So if you could, if you, if you had a way, but uh, I mean, this is the point so that you don't, don't have a way. We don't have you... a relation. We cannot define a relation between the numbers and the, element of the structure exactly exactly ah, I see. so so this, those are really two disjoint uh, you think about this as two disjoint structures one which gives you the power of counting and the other one which 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 contains the relation of the structure but uh, those are completely dis i mean disjoint uh, disjoint domains and uh, yeah and in general there is no way of defining a bijection okay if you could then you would indeed order the the structure and then you could uh, could do anything uh, which is in p time okay thank you so yeah. formally, all relations in this signature will then still be over, like only over A. So you, you can't mix like 
elements in A and, and numbers. That is what you're saying. Is that yes, exactly. So in some sense, the the structure that you like the the structure that you I mean, you, it's like a, you say that you evaluated the formula on the structure A, but when you evaluate it, you look at the structure A, a and a, with and a disjoint sum of the structure with a structure which as a universe has this ordered domain and then the order plus n times. And the only way, so th this, those are two disjoint structures and the only way you can communicate, I mean, uh, you, can, uh, you can communicate between those structures is you can define, you can say that, uh, that you want to talk about the number of, like, I mean, uh, I don't know, three, is the number of elements of of a which satisfies that sum phi, and this is how you refer to this uh, to the element of the of the order or, or, or the, of the number domain. But you don't have any other. I mean, but you know, like when in the in your input, you don't have any any uh, relations which would uh, relate in any way the elements of a and the elements of this. Uh, actually, it starts with zero, and the elements of this ordered domain. Okay. Okay, good. Um, okay, so this is the property. Okay, so now I would like to um, give you a sketch of a proof. Uh, I mean, of this 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 proof that uh, graph isomorphism problem for graphs of degree three cannot be expressed in fixed point logic with counting. Uh, I mean. Yeah, this is going to be a sketch, but I think it's still a, still a nice uh, a, a nice construction. Uh, so the key tool for proving inexpressibility in fixed point logic with counting is the equivalence in, in infinitary logic. So this will be the third logic that I will define, and I promise that this will be the last one. Uh, so we are talking about finite variable infinitary logic with counting. Uh, so in this logic, we have, I mean, again, this is something which is built on top of uh, first order logic. So you have everything you can do with in first order logic. And on top of this, you have counting quantifiers. So you can write uh, formulas which say that there exists at least I elements X that satisfy some formula phi, where I mean, this is this is you. You can just uh, write. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna maybe this take this. This is this. This can be just uh, some natural number. Uh, you can use infinite disjunctions, disjunctions and conjunctions of formulas. But you, I mean, since since you could you can use infinite disjunctions and conjunction in conjunctions, you could uh, you could think. I mean, you could just write a formula which would have. Uh, infinitely many, which you would use infinitely many variables. So you restrict the number of variables that you use in each formula to some finite number. So this logic is, uh, I mean, it's interesting because it's kind of uh, completely orthogonal to complexity classes in some sense. So for instance, if you take any, uh, any cardinality, I mean, you, you take any subset of natural numbers, you can write with the single variable, a formula which says that the uh, the domain of your structure has cardinality which belongs to C. So uh, I mean you have a formula phi n which says that there exists at least x uh, at least n elements which uh, I mean which such that x equals x. So there exists at least n elements in your structure, and it's not true that there exists at least n plus one. So this formula just says that there exists that your structure has n elements. And then you can just write, you can take a disjunction, I mean, an infinite, I mean, potentially infinite disjunction of those formulas. And uh, well, I'm, and that's it. You, you express the fact that, uh, that, your, that the, the number of elements of your structure is some number from C. So in particular, clearly you can write, you can express in this logic undecidable properties. But on the other hand, as it will, as it will turn out, for instance, you cannot express uh, the isomorphism problem for graphs of degree three and uh, and some other properties that are obviously in polynomial time. So so in this sense, uh, I would say that this is uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, interesting logic. So uh, it can be uh, it can be sh shown that uh, 
if you have a formula of fixed point logic with counting with k variables, then there exists an equivalent formula of this uh, infinitary counting logic, which uses two k variables. So in particular, anything that you can express in fixed point logic with counting, you can also expre express in this infinitary counting logic. And the way, uh, and it turns out that the, 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 the easy, maybe, but maybe easiest way of, uh, of showing inexpressibility in fixed point logic with counting is to show that some property is not expressible in this infinitary counting logic, which I mean, which is actually much more powerful. Um, okay, so this is this is the strategy. Um, so to show that some property is not expressible in FPC, we show that it's not expressible in this infinitary counting logic, and we do this by, by constructing two families of structures, structures A and structures B, such that structures A uh, have the property that we are talking about. Structures B do not have the property that we are talking about. And we show that for every I, structure A and structure, uh, structure AI and structure BI satisfy exactly the same sentences of those, this infinitary counting logic with I variables. So I think it's pretty clear that if we if we are able to construct this kind of uh, family of structures, then this means that uh, that uh, the, the property cannot be expressed by a formula of this infinitary counting logic with any number of variables. So this is how, uh, uh, how this uh, inexpressibility result goes. And why, uh, and, and why uh, kind of uh, what, what helps us to, uh, to show this kind of thing is a combinatorial characterization of this uh, of this equivalence relation with i i mean the, the relation of satisfying exactly the same exactly the same uh, sentences of, of of the logic so i mean this is one of one one way of of uh, of defining this so this is um, i mean one one characterization but there are some other characterization on also in terms of pebble games but uh, yeah so we have at least one combinatorial characterization of this equivalence so this is a K pebble bijection game. We have two players, spoiler and duplicator. They play on two structures, A and B. They have K pairs of corresponding pebbles. So uh, A1 corresponds to B1 and so on. And this is what happens in the game. First spoiler chooses some pair of pebbles, A, I, B, I. Duplicator has to Re, uh, has, has to respond with the bijection between the elements of the structures. So, so this 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 game, like if duplicator is supposed to be able to play, then in, in particular the the structures. Then the, I mean, kind of duplicator being able to, to play means that the structures satisfy the same formulas of counting logic. So, since we've already seen that using one variable we can express the cardinality being uh, some concrete natural number. Then in particular, the structures, I mean, if the structures have different cardinality, then the duplicator loses immediately. So duplicator chooses, so assuming that duplicator does not lose immediately, he chooses a bijection between the elements of the structure, such that for all pairs of, so, so some pairs of pebbles are already on the structures. The, the A pebbles are on the structure A and the B pebbles are on the structure B. So for those pebbles that are on the structure and which are not this, this uh, chosen pair A, I, B, I, this bijection has to agree with, with, with the, I mean, yeah, H of A, A, J has to be B, J uh, for anything that, uh, that is already uh, on the, put on the structures. And then, uh, so once duplicator chooses this bijection, spoiler chooses some element of A and puts A, A, A I on this element and the pebble B, I on the image of this element, so on H, H, A. And then duplicator loses if the partial map, which is defined by the corresponding pairs of pebbles is not a partial isomorphism. And we say that, uh, okay, and then uh, duplicator, what, what was, I mean, this, this game was proposed by Hella in, in 96. And uh, what he showed is that duplicator can play forever if and only if the two structures satisfy exactly the same 
sentences of uh, this infinitary counting logic with k variables. So, I mean, uh, by playing forever, of course, duplicate, I mean, uh, spoiler can choose pebbles which are already on the board, he, board, he picks them up, duplicator, ex, uh, duplicator responds with some bijection, spoiler puts the pebbles down and, and so on, right? So we can, we can pick up the pebbles which are already on the structure and, uh, and, yeah, and play, uh, play forever. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the kind of uh, combinatorial tool that we are using to show uh, equivalence. So in this strategy that I, that I, that I um, described here, we, want, we need to construct a family of structures, AI which have the property, BI which do not have the property, and we show that duplicator cannot, uh, I mean, and we show that duplicator can still play forever on, on those pairs of the structures, uh, I mean, uh, with more and more pebbles. Okay, so that's the bijection game. Okay, so now- uh, so Sorry, a question the, yes? about mm -hmm. the bijection game. So I didn't understand. So does duplicator, so how do we know like which pebbles are already on the structure and which are added? Or can duplicator, I mean, can duplicator rearrange all pebbles in every round or is it, 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 or like the pebbles being extended somehow, like one pebble at one pair at a time, or how uh, does this work? Let's let's just. Uh, I mean, maybe I will draw this. So suppose that. Uh, I mean, uh, okay. So let's say that we have some pebbles here. Okay. This. Uh, so you have corresponding pebbles. So let's draw them like that. Okay, and then there are some more elements in the structures. So let's say that uh, that uh, spoiler chooses those two pebbles. So this is kind of as if he would just uh, take them from the board. Let's say that he just he chose this pair of pebbles, so he ta takes this off the board, board. Then duplicator has to respond with a bijection, but this bijection has to uh, has to respect what is already on the board. So this thing this can has to be assigned to this this has to be assigned to this and then anything uh, i mean then anything is allowed so this is this is the duplicator's move and then spoiler chooses okay so spoiler says okay so i will put this pebble let's say here and then he's he's forced to put uh, the other pebble here because this is what the bijection tells him. So let's say that th those are all the pebbles. I mean, let's say that we are playing with three pairs of pebbles. So now uh, again, spoiler can say, so now we forget about the bijection. Uh, we forget about the bijection and let's say that spoiler now says, okay, so now I'm gonna pick up those two pebbles and, uh, and so on. I mean, and now uh, again, uh, duplicator, has to respond with the bijection, which now kind of, uh, which, which, which satisfies, I mean, this has to be mapped to this, this has to be mapped to this, but then otherwise it can be anything he wants. And again, we put the, we put the pebbles back. So the spoiler puts the pebbles, let's say here and here. Is it uh, is it clear now? I, I don't know. Yeah, it's clear. clear. I think it can. I mean, and sometimes you have this game where you like build up to a maximum budget of K, and then you can like you can add or you can forget. But here, I mean, I guess without loss of generality, we're always playing with a maximum number of pebbles, and then like remove one and add it again somehow. Is yes, yes. I mean, you you can. I mean, you can think that at the beginning the pebbles are kind of lying off the board, and so and first you put them. I mean, you could even probably, I mean, spoiler could just forget that he has three pairs of pebbles and just play as if he had just two pairs of pebbles. Uh, and I mean, you know, never pick the blue blue pair and leave it on the side. But I mean, this doesn't, uh, right? I mean, spoiler wants to wants to spoil it, so so he would probably always use the use the maximal number of pebbles that he has, right? So, yeah. but once mm -hmm. they're all on the board, you can pick them again, you can pick them up and put them back again. And uh, yeah, so, so there is, I mean, there are some restrictions. So, I mean, you could talk also about some, if you, if you are interested in some uh, uh, quantifier alternation and stuff like this, you could uh, restrict the number of, uh, number of rounds. And I mean, there are some, there are some, uh, Details that uh, I mean, some some variants of the game which corresponds to some restricted variants, uh, some restricted restricted versions of the of the logic. But 
but in our context, this is, uh, I mean, this is not, uh, not uh, that important. And just one more question in terms of buzzwords. Mm -hmm. So are these what are sometimes called Aaron Fuist Frise games, or this is something different? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, okay. yeah. OK, good. Uh, I mean, this is like one of the many, I, I guess there would be called in general Aaron Fuist Frise games, yes. OK, so. Um, so what uh, Seifur and Immermann showed more precisely is that there is a family of pairs of non-isomorphic three regular graphs with uh, O of n vertices. So this is actually not so important for the inexpressibility result, but will be important uh, later for our lower bounds. So this, this number of vertices is also important uh, such that uh, they are indistinguishable using, I mean, GN and HN are indistinguishable using N pebbles. So duplicator can play forever using N pebbles. So, uh, I mean, this, this, uh, I mean, this theorem, uh, this, how this theorem is stated does not immediately give, a, give us this strategy that I, that I uh, described a while ago. So let's see exactly how this theorem gives us, uh, I mean, gives us this family of structures that I was uh, that I was talking about. So uh, so yes. Yeah, so, so as a corollary corollary of this, there is no sentence of infinitary counting logic, which for any pair of three regular graphs G and H would decide the homomorphism. So uh, sub, so so in the sense that the uh, this joint union of G and H would satisfy this sentence if and only if the graphs are isomorphic. And why, why, why is there no such a sentence? Why we have this inexpressibility result? Because we can take two families of structures. One family of structures will be the disjoint union of GN with GN. So by GN, I mean GN and HN are from the Seifure and Immermann theorem. So one family of structures would be the disjoint union of GN plus GN. And the second family of structure would be the disjoint, disjoint union of GN and HN. So in, indeed, the first family satisfies the property, meaning that the graphs are isomorphic. The second family does not satisfy the property. The graphs are non-isomorphic, as in the statement of the, of the theorem. But I mean, uh, since, the, since G and, and H and satisfy the same sentences of this infinitary counting logic with n variables, not surprisingly, this, this joint union satisfies the same sentences with again with n variables that as this disjoint union so indeed we we can what well, this this theorem of cyphered even gives us exactly this this kind of uh, this kind of uh, family of families of structures that we need to show that the graph isomorphism problem is not expressible in and in particular graph isomorphism problem for three regular graphs is not expressible in uh, infinitary counting logic so this would be like the, the end of the proof. And now uh, I want to kind of finish this, uh, this part of... Uh, can this. can I ask, uh, mm -hmm. so what goes into their proof of this indistinguishability? Like what, what's the, how do I construct the graph? Is expander enough? Yeah. So yeah. So this is this is what I want to uh, this is what I want to exactly this is what, what I want to tell you about now. So this is I mean uh, yeah. I, this is not going to be a very like completely detailed this, uh, construction, but uh, but yeah. But I want to give you a little bit about uh, tell you a little bit about this. So yeah. So this is this is what uh, what they did. So first we are taking graphs. So I mean basically a single graph actually. So by this, uh, I mean, uh, you have uh, you have uh, vertices of the graph. Uh, I, mean, I mean, everywhere here you have vertices of the graph, and also this graph is a torus. So you want it to be. I mean, you want it to be a three regular graph. So you, uh, I mean, uh, basically, this is the same as this, and uh, and so on. I mean, uh, it's it's folded both ways, and uh, and I mean uh, here, here and here you also have a vertex which is the same vertex. So is it clear? I mean, uh, yeah, this is uh, this graph is a torus, so I hope it's uh, it's clear. And you have those uh, those uh, 
I think those are hex hexagons, no, they're not hexagons, whatever. So yeah, so this is a three regular graph, which will be the base of our construction. So this is kind of also can be seen as a grid N by N. So here, this will be four by four. And you basically encode, uh, I mean, it's in some sense, you basically encode the citing formulas as a graph. Although I think that the, the connection between citing and, and this, this construction has, I mean, it, it wasn't immediate. Also, I think that this is not exactly the original, uh, the, the way they, they uh, define it, like, uh, I think this is a slight modification, which was, which was done later, uh, this exact presentation. Okay, so now you want to encode. So, so now you, you, you label, the, so, so, so far we had just one graph. So now we want to construct two different graphs. I mean, for every N, we want to get two different graphs. So you label the vertices of those graphs. So in this, in the case of this, this guy, you labor, label each vertex by zero. And in the case of this graph, you label all vertices except for one by zero and one uh, that you choose, you label by one. Um, okay, so, uh, so actually, more precisely, you could you could uh, you could take any labeling, and if the sum of ones is in the sum if the sum of ones is even, then you, if you have even I mean evenly many ones, then the graph that you will construct in the end will be always the same. I mean the graphs that you will construct the family of graphs will be isomorphic, and then you get another family if the number of ones that you put. Is, uh, is odd, then you will get another family of isomorphic graphs. So in the end, you just get two graphs. I mean, uh, whatever labeling you choose, you can get up to, isomorphic, up to isomorphism one or the other graph. I mean, at the end of our construction. Okay, and now you encode, basically uh, you replace, I mean, you replace each edge. Okay, maybe, maybe even more high level. So basically you re replace each vertex. So, the, so each vertex is supposed to express the fact that the sum of the edges that are adja adjacent to this vertex is uh, one or zero, depending on the label. And you basically encode this by a small gadget. And that's it. So, I mean, I, I did not draw the gadget. I, I could do this, but... Uh, but yeah, but that's it. And this way you get, uh, I mean, the, the number of vertices of this graph, I think is uh, 3n, I mean, n of maybe maybe a bit more, maybe like 5n or something like this. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's it. And then, uh, I mean, one thing that you need to show, but this is basically kind of immediate from the fact that the, the two graphs encode, one, one of them encodes a satisfiable system of, equation of, of equations not two and the other one encodes an unsatisfiable system of equation not two, then it's quite immediate that they are non-isomorphic. But then, uh, I mean, the, 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 the tricky part is to show that for every n, the, the two graphs that you get, uh, I mean, duplicator can always fool the spoiler and can continue moving the pebbles around uh, uh, infinitely. I mean, yeah. So, uh, so that's it. That's the kind of uh, well, that the the sketch of the construct of the construction uh, i don't know if uh, if uh, if you are satisfied with this or so you said that somehow the vertices become gadgets yeah so uh, yes yes and is that so, complicated to explain oh, oh i mean no <laughs> not, not so much i mean I, I think that what is then what is complicated is actually playing the game and i think that this i i I, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, I, I think I don't want to uh, improvise this, but the gadgets I think that are not so difficult. So, okay, so basically what you do is you split. So maybe let's try to find some, ah, here, this is good. Okay, so let's say that, uh, so here we have, uh, we have three uh, edges, right? A E1, E2 and E3. And let's say that the, the vertex is labeled by zero. So what you do is you split the uh, split it like instead of each each edge, you want to have two vertices. So and then this is e two zero e two one. So this is this kind of uh, corresponds to mapping this edge this this variable to zero and one 
E1, 0, E1, 1, and E3, 0, E3, 1. Okay, and now since you want this vertex to be mapped to 0, you basically uh, put together all valuations which uh, give you 0. So uh, let's say you have here 0, 0, and 0 will map, will, will, if you add it modulo 2, it will give you 0. So this is why you take 0, 0, and 0, and you join it bar by a vertex. Now, uh, again, 0, 1, and 1 will also add up to 0, which means that you can take 0, 1, and 1, and add, and you, you join them with the vertex. And, uh, and what? And we have like uh, two more possibilities, right? So we can take 0, 1, and 1. And I forgot about something. Uh -huh. OK. Uh, yeah, OK, 0 here, 1, and 1. So basically, you, you yeah, so this is those, vert those two vertices each. I mean, in each case, two vertices correspond to mapping this variable to 0 and to 1. And you tell the, I mean, you, you just, uh, yeah, you just indicate which uh, which assignments are the, are the assignments that satisfy this, uh, this constraint. Uh, so now uh, you have two options. If you want actually to get graphs which are three regular, that I, I mean, what I wanted to 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 do the, to do here, then you have to, um, I mean, then basically you have to introduce actually more. I mean, if you if if you would if we could stop here and this would be also fine. It's just that this way, I mean, since you have here another vertex, the graph will actually, I mean, that you would have vertices with uh, four edges. So, I mean, and since I said that I want three regular graphs, you actually have to, for each edge, you actually have to define more, uh, I mean, you have to define more uh, vertices and just uh, connect them like this so that you can, so, so that you actually get something which is three regular, but that's, I mean, that's the technical detail. But basically if, if the vertex, if the vertex here is, is uh, labeled by zero, then you do this. And if it's mapped by one, then you do the, I mean, then you do the opposite thing. I mean, you join together the valuations that uh, up, sum up to one modulo two. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so that's it. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, I mean, then we could I mean, we could show. I mean, there are different things that we can show about this. But uh, uh, for instance, like an yeah, well, whatever. So maybe I will not get into into more details about about this. So, uh, any more questions about uh, this CFI construction? So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it would be actually interested to describe the the strategy for duplicator, but uh, but yeah, but I'm afraid. Uh, I, I yeah I don't want to improvise and also I this would take uh, quite some time so um, okay so that's it so uh, so in particular I mean this is not exactly visible here but and we we would have to talk about uh, how to encode systems of linear equations but it's kind of I, I hope it's kind of clear that you can use uh, I mean you you can uh, do something I mean some kind of reduction and show that. From, from this uh, CFI construction, it also follows that solving systems of linear equations uh, over Z2 is not expressible in, uh, in this infinitary counting logic. So in particular, also not, uh, not expressible in fixed point logic with counting. So this is another uh, thing which you can uh, clearly do in polynomial time, but you cannot, uh, you cannot express in fixed point logic with counting. Mm. Yeah, and... Uh, and, and another two things uh, which will be important for our lower bounds. So since uh, since in this construction, the pairs of graphs which are uh, which we construct, which are indistinguishable using n variables, they have O of n vertices. Then this shows in particular that I mean. So if you just look at graphs which have at most n vertices, then you can always write a formula of uh, 
of this of this logic with n variables that will decide the graph isomorphism for graphs with at most n vertices. So here we, I mean, it follows from this construction that uh, you do need, I mean, you, you do need uh, the number of, of variables to be to be linear in the in the number of, of elements of your structure to decide graph isomorphism and also to decide uh, to solve systems of linear equations in this logic. So now we are talking about you know, different formulas for different uh, for different uh, cardinality of of elements of the structure, and we have we have uh, we have this kind of uh, lower bounds, which will be important for our uh, for our applications later. Uh, okay, so I think this is maybe a good good uh, place to to make a break. So basically, that's that's it for for the final model theory background. And now I will move to uh, to discussing expressibility of of uh, proof search in uh, in uh, basically in fixed point logic with counting. Well. I mean, not only, but uh, yeah. So I think that maybe we can now uh, take a few minutes break and uh, yeah, and see you in uh, like uh, five minutes. So we are back after the break for the second half. Fiona, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Massimo, you want to? Yes. Uh, I wish to ask a question. Could you, uh, I, I just um, lost uh, uh, in the end, uh, how you get these corollaries about the number of variables from the statement. So can you show the statement, uh, the earlier statement and these corollaries? Yes. So, so, uh, so basically you could, you could think of, I mean, you could look at this, this corollary, it's just that in this corollary, I don't state the, the um, I did not state the number of vert like what is the number of vertices, so those vertices have O of, of n. But those graphs have O of n vertices. So basically, this corollary implies that if you now look at all graphs with, uh, I mean, let's say at, at most n vertices. And you want to write a formula of uh, this infinitary counting logic, which would define the isomorphism. Then this formula would have to have a linear number of variables in the in the number of, of vertices. Okay. Uh, yeah, and this is exactly what I want to express uh, here by saying that deciding graph isomorphism require requires linear number of variables. And actually, this is also an upper bound because, uh, I mean, basically, you can, uh, if you have n vertices, then you can write wh whatever you want using n variables in this in this logic using this infinite uh, conjunctions and disjunctions. And then this corollary after about systems of equations is, I mean, we didn't really show this, but this is kind of an intuition that uh, that since those CFI graphs can be seen as encoding systems of linear equations, then uh, a similar thing holds for for systems of linear equations. But there is no discussion about numbers of variables here. Uh, I mean, then uh, wait. In in what sense there is no discussion about number? Uh, the the first lines that I'm seeing now. Here you here I did not write anything about variables, but somehow, but the the corollary is supposed to be a corollary of what I what is. Uh, what is here? I mean, uh, wait, no, I, I, this is not, this is not what I wanted to say. This is this and basically this. So you have those families of structures. So here we are talking about variables, right? Yes. Yeah. So then as a corollary of this, you have this lower bound for variables. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that I got lost in your questions. Is it, is it clear now or? Because I see three colors, three color coronaries and they don't see exactly the difference between the first and the third, like down there, the last, uh, maybe I'm missing some. Uh... Ah, yeah, 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 okay, so yes, so so here in the first corollary, I just, because since we were talking about isomorphism not being expressible in this logic, I, I just wrote that, uh, by the way, those, since it encodes systems of linear equations, then then also solving systems of linear equations is not expressible as a kind of uh, general, I mean, there's no formula which would express it over graphs or 
I mean, arbitrary, I mean, arbitrary systems of linear equations. And by the way, even more precisely, we have those lower bounds of the, on the number of variables. Mm. Ah, so, okay. so that's why, uh, yeah. So, so that's why, I mean, this is just, uh, yeah, just how I wrote, how I, how I wrote it on, on the slide, but, uh, Okay, yeah, but it. in particular, the first corollary is follows from the last corollary on the slide. Okay. Now I thought that you were like different reasoning <coughs> that they had missed something. Thank no, you. no, no. Thanks. Uh, okay. So now we are moving to expressing um, the proof search, search problem in different logics. Can uh, I ask a question yes? before? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, Hi. So the the three regular isomorphism problem is not my first guess for a problem that would be in p and would be hard my first guess so is it for example can we use match perfect matching to do a similar is it known um, or some other I think that perfect matching is expressible in fixed point logic with counting, but uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't really, yeah, I don't really remember one hundred percent, but I think it is expressible in fixed point logic with counting. So I think that basically the really the the kind of the two key examples here are uh, the graph isomorphism problem. Actually, there are some other variants which are also not expressible in fixed point logic with counting that are in p time and solving systems of uh, linear equations over finite fields or like or also over over um, over abelian groups. But uh, yeah, th those were those would be like the two uh, main examples here. So, so, so the solving linear equations is like Gauss and elimin elimination, which is maybe this would be a first like a natural but yeah. so it, on the other hand i will i will show in a moment that solving systems of linear equations over the uh, the the rationals is expressible in fixed point logic with counting so there is uh, so so it's kind of interesting that if you are talking about finite fields then you can show that it's not and uh, and then over the rational it is so uh, and yeah and all the versions of the perfect matching you know are can be actually expressive. expressive. I think, but I, I don't want to lie. I think that they can, but uh, but uh, yeah, but I am not one hundred percent sure, so I don't want to say something. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. So since we will now want to encode in logic uh, some problems, which I mean, so far we were basically talking about. Uh, about graphs, so it was kind of uh, intuitive what it means. I mean, the, the input that the, the formulas were taking as input graphs and the algorithm were taking as input graphs. So this was kind of clear what what we mean by like, what, what, does the, what do we evaluate the formula on? So I just want to comment, uh, like say a little bit about how we encode, how we can encode uh, inputs for different problems as relational structures. So in general, kind of my, my general comment is that, I mean, when we are talking about algorithms, then we also have to represent the input in some way. And usually there is some natural way that we, I mean, this, there, there can be different options, but somehow there is several natural choices and the complexity of the problem does not really de de depend on the, on the kind of encoding we choose. So there is some kind of general understanding what the encoding will look like. So in so here it's somehow similar. So we need to, if we are, want to say that some problem is expressible in logic or not expressible in logic, then there is somehow a, a whole bunch of ways you could encode the input of this problem as a relational structure, so that this actually, I mean, so that you can actually evaluate some formulas on this relational structure. And it doesn't really, I mean, the, the precise uh, results that we get do not really depend on this encoding. Um, but anyway, I want to give you some examples. And one more thing. So in general, also like when we are thinking about a natural way of encoding an input here as a relational structure, then the size of this relational structure would be 
the same as the natural encoding that you think of if you want to encode it as a, I mean, input for a Turing machine. So there is, a, I mean, yeah, so kind of, there is, a, it's kind of close one to the other. Okay, so first let's let's have a look. Let's quickly have a look about an, uh, on encoding of a on on of a matrix. So we have a matrix uh, where the, the the rows are indexed by u and the columns are indexed by v, and we encode it as a, as as follows. So we take uh, we take the sets u and v of uh, of coordinates. Uh, we take some ordered structure some ordered domain b which will be kind of with like so this will be this ordered domain so it's it should be large enough this n has, should be large enough to represent the numerators and denominators with n plus one bits so this is this this uh, this defines linear old order on this domain so that we really know that some bit is is the first one and and so on and then we have a we have three ternary relations which encode the sign, the numerator and the denominator of each uh, well, each, each, each uh, number in the matrix. So for instance, PN encodes the numerators. So it's a ternary relation and I, so it's a ternary relation which is a subset of, of, of this, uh, this product. And I U V belongs to this relation, even only if the ith bit of the numerator of this uh, element of the of the matrix is one, and uh, and so on. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. So we similarly we encode the, the denominator, and for, for the sign we just uh, say that uh, let's say uh, zero U V belongs to the relation if and only if the the sign is uh, is negative or, or positive. I mean that's that's just a convention. So here we have an, an example of, of how we could encode a matrix. Uh, and now uh, let's say that we want to encode a, systems, a system of uh, linear inequalities. So we have a matrix and, and a vector. So again, so we have, we have uh, sets U and V, which represents the constraints and the variables. We have this ordered domain B, which is big enough to represent, to represent all the bits. It's ordered. And then we have ternary relations, which will encode the sign nominator and denominators, uh, numerators and denominators in the of the matrix A, and similarly, similar binary relations, which will do the same for the vector B. So uh, I mean that's uh, that's just to give you an example uh, if you haven't seen this before. So that's I mean that's one way, one 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 natural way to do it. Okay, so now uh, what I want to talk about in the second part of my talk is the expressibility of proof search for several uh, proof systems. So bounded with resolution, bounded degree Shirley Adams and bounded degree sum of squares. So I will, I mean, for the, the, the resolution I will discuss very briefly. So the, the proof search is expressible in the existential fragment of fixed point logic with uh, O of K variables. And then uh, for Shirley Adams, it's going to be fixed point logic with counting. And for some of squares, it's going to be this uh, infinitary counting logic. So here are some, some references. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to start by briefly discussing the results on the bounded degree resolution. And then I want to get into the details of the proof for Shirley Adams and sum of squares, which uh, actually I mean, are very closely related. So um, yeah, so the the relationship between uh, resolution and logic, I think, has been first. Uh, I mean, was first studied by Albert in in two thousand four. So he showed that the. I mean, this is not exactly what he showed, but almost uh, that the proof search for with K resolution is expressible in the existential positive fragment of fixed fixed point logic using O of K variables. So I mean I think by now you already know. So there is this there. I mean what it what it means. What I mean by this. So there is a, there is a sentence of of this logic, such that for every CNF, uh, uh, f f has a with k resolution refutation if and only if some encoding. Again we need to fix some encoding, of of this structure satisfies uh, this sentence. So I mean this is not exactly what he showed, but it's kind of very close to this. 
so then in the, in the kind of a few years later, uh, Albert Azarias and Victor Dalmau uh, showed this very nice and I think quite well known result about uh, uh, I mean, characterization, combinatorial characterization of resolution width. So they showed that uh, an RCNFF has a resolution reputation of width k, if and only if spoiler wins the existential k plus one table game on uh, two structures. So this is an encoding of the CNF, and this is, uh, let's say, an encoding of satisfying assignment. Uh, so I, I don't want to discuss this result in detail. So this existential k plus one table game uh, I mean, it's somehow similar to the Pebble game that, I mean, in spirit, it's similar to the Pebble games that I discussed before. And it was co introduced by Colitis and Vardy in the context of this, this, this logic that uh, I mentioned also in the previous, on the previous sli slide. And uh, I mean, let me just uh, I mean, say that, well, I mean, this result allowed to re-derive all previously known uh, resolution, uh, resolution with lower bounds. And uh, as we discussed uh, a little bit with Mika also during the break, uh, I mean, this correspondence between resolution width and, and capable games probably could uh, could somehow indicate that we could translate this duplicator strategy for CFI graphs into uh, directly into resolution with uh, lower bound. But uh, yeah, maybe let's uh, let's not get get into this um, anymore for now. Uh, and finally, also this 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 theorem, this correspondence between uh, resolution width and and uh, pebble games allowed to show that uh, space for resolution is lower bounded by width. Um, yeah, so 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 that's that's basically it. And then uh, much more recently, uh, Gredel, Groe, Pago, and Pakusa uh, established a very close correspondence between resolution width and uh, slightly stronger logic. So here we thought we have. The, just the existential fragment of fixed point logic. So before we had the existential positive fragment. So what is interesting about this result, although it's, I mean, it's not so important for lower bounds, but I think this is this is uh, this is also interesting, is that they have a co they have a correspondence both ways. So on one hand, I mean, as we already know, because this logic is stronger, then the proof search is of course expressible in this logic since it was already expressible in this in this weaker logic, this existential positive fragment of fixed point logic. But we also have the 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 um, uh, we also can show the uh, implication the other way around. So if we have some property which is definable by some sentence of this existential fixed point logic, then it can be somehow decided by width k resolution. So what do we mean by this? There exists a bunch of first order formulas such that if we, you take any structure then using this, those first order formulas, so this is, uh, you can see this as kind of a reduction, like first, first order definable reduction, you can construct another structure, FA. This FA is, is an encoding of a, of a CNF. And so we have this reduction from structures to encodings of CNFs. And the structure has this property, so satisfies the sentence, if and only if this CNF that we have encoded here has a width k refutation. So this is the, I mean, this is, they kind of, they established a few more. I mean, they also, they also looked at, uh, for instance, at polynomial calculus and that some other um, uh, restrictions of, res of resolution and, ex and established this kind of very tight re uh, relationship between proof systems and logic, which go not only, I mean, not only the proof system, the proof search is expressible, but also you have this implication the other way around. So whatever you can decide in logic, you can somehow decide using this, uh, this proof system. So this is not so important, as I said, this is not so important for lower bounds, but I think this is, this is also uh, an interesting connection. Okay, so that's it for resolution. So as I said, I just want to uh, kind of briefly mention the, the key results here. So now let's let us move to uh, to sum of squares and Shirley Adams. So just uh, let me briefly remind you the definition. So now we are talking about uh, semi-algebraic proof systems. So we want to show that some system of polynomial inequalities that we have here does not have a solution, and the sum of square refutation looks like this. So we have uh, this kind of polynomial uh, polynomial identity. 
where we can multiply polynomials pj, which are either the original polynomials Polynomials multiplied by sum of squares. Uh, oops. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Something was happening on my side with the sound. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you right now, your last sentence, yes. Okay, sorry. I just, I actually, I have no clue what happened, but somehow for, for a moment, everything disconnected. Both both this and I think that also this, uh, okay, but good, uh, okay, so. This is the wonder so of Zoom where... land, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, but uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is, so this kind of polynomial identity, uh, I mean, it, it's a sum of squares proof that uh, that this system of polynomial inequalities does not have a solution. And then similarly, uh, Shalali Adams refutation looks, I mean, very similar. It's just that instead of multiplying things by sum of squares, uh, by sum of squares, you we multiply them by extended monomials. So those are polynomials of this form where xi, uh, well, xi's and j, xj's are some, uh, some uh, variables which appear in the, in the original, uh, in the original system. And c is supposed to be, be non-negative. Okay, so that's there's a definition, and then uh, just quickly, uh, I mean, the properties of those proof systems. So uh, we always can show both in, I mean, whenever the system has no zero one solution, so we are interested in zero one solutions, then we can prove this both in Shirley Adams and, and sum of squares. And also, uh, Shirley, uh, sum of squares is stronger. I, I'm never sure that if whether sh it should not be actually 2D here. I think at some point I, real I analyzed this and it should be 2D. But anyway, if there exists a Shirley Adams refutation of degree D, then there exists a uh, sum of square refutations of a refutation of degree D or maybe 2D, something like this. Uh, so yeah, so I think that uh, basically uh, yeah, everybody knows this. So just, uh, just to uh, sum up briefly. Okay, so now uh, we will be talking about expressibility in logics of uh, bounded degree versions of those uh, proof systems. Um, so what is the degree D, Shirali Adams? refutation. So, well, I mean, it's the same. It's just that we require now the degree of all those polynomials that appear here to be bounded by, by D. And in particular, uh, if, we, if we impose this, this restriction, then it's, uh, it's kind of clear that we can write the existence of such a Shirley Adams refutation of degree D uh, as uh, I mean, as a system of, uh, of linear inequalities. So those linear inequalities will basically say that we will have a bunch of linear inequalities, which will say that the coefficients, I mean, all coefficients here have to be equal zero instead of, uh, except for the, the coefficient of the, of, of, uh, I mean, the, the constant uh, term of, or however it's, it's, uh, it's called, which has to be equal mean minus one. So we have to write all of this. And also we have to write uh, that all those C's that appear uh, in, the, in the extended monomials have to be uh, non-negative. So this way we, we get a bunch of polynomial equations and inequalities, which, I mean, this system has a solution if and only if there exists a degree D, Shirley Adams refutation of, uh, of those original polynomial inequalities. So I hope this is more or less clear. So this means in particular that deciding whether degree D Shirley Adams refutation exists uh, reduces to deciding feasibility of linear programs. So actually, when we want to talk about, I mean, uh, when I will be talking about expressing the proof search for degree D Shirley Adams, what I actually want to discuss is the fact that feasibility of linear programs is expressible in fixed point logic with counting. So this is a theorem with, of Anderson, Davar, and Holm. And basically all the key ideas that, I mean, almost all the key ideas that I want to discuss in the second part of my, of my talk are uh, in this work of, uh, of Anderson, Davar, and Holm. So we are gonna discuss a little bit, I mean, we're almost gonna discuss this theorem. 
uh, yeah, so so there, there is a sentence of FPC such that for every linear program, P is feasible if and only if, and we've already seen one way of encoding linear programs as structures. So so you can you can kind of imagine what is this structure, if and only if this structure, which corresponds to P, it satisfies uh, this sentence phi. So this is what this theorem says. Um, yeah, so so since so so in particular, this means that proof search. So once we have this this theorem of Anderson uh, and co-authors, we have uh, we can uh, derive this corollary, which says that proof search for degree D Chevalier Adams is expressible in fixed point logic with counting, with linear number of uh, of uh, I mean with number of variables which is linear in that degree. So let's just have a look how it like how it goes. So we start with a system of polynomial inequalities. So in the in the terms, I mean, in the sense for logic, uh, we we just encode the system as some as some as some structure. Then this is easy to do from the encoding of a system of polynomial uh, inequalities. We can produce an encoding of this linear program, which expresses the fact that there exists a degree D uh, Shirley Adams reputation. So we can do this using a first order plus counting uh, formulas. So I, I, I mean, this is just to give you an intuition. So you basically write a bunch of formulas which, uh, which use the power of first order logic plus you have also this, uh, this, uh, this extra structure which, uh, which allows you to count. So from this system of polynomial inequalities, you produce the linear program, both I mean, encoding of the system, if you produce encoding of the, of, the, of the linear program, this is easy. So this is, there, is, there is nothing to do here. The only important thing is that the number of variables here will depend on the degree of the Shirley Adams proof that we are interested in. And then we have this, so this follows from the theorem of Anderson, Davar and Holm. So we have this fixed formula phi, which decides whether this system has a solution or not. So once we compose this formula, which is this, I mean, the existence of this formula is actually complicated. Once we compose this formula with this interpretation, which is easy, we get the desired uh, FPC formula with, where the, where, where the uh, number of variables is linear in the degree. Because basically, when, once we compose the, the formulas, the number of variables multiplies. So this has fixed number of variables. This has number of variables linear in D. So this formula that we will get at the end, which will decide the proof search, which will have, uh, I mean, that, that will be still linear in D because there, this will be a multiplication. So this is how we get the expressibility of proof search once we know that we can decide the feasibility of linear programs in fixed point logic with counting. Is this uh, more or less clear? I mean, uh, I, I omitted the, the key part, which is expressibility of linear programming, but, uh, but is this, uh, this uh... okay, good. Um, okay, perfect. So now we can do, so, so okay, so I will get back to this definability of, of linear programming. But before we do this, I would like to uh, say a very similar thing for degree D sum of squares. So degree, uh, deciding whether there exists a degree D sum of square refutations, refutation reduces in a similar way to deciding feasibility of SDPs. So what is an SDP? Well, in an SDP, you have a matrix of variables, which you require to be positive semi-definite which means that it has to be symmetric and for any vector z, it has to satisfy this inequality, inequality or uh, equivalently x, I mean, x is positive semi-definite if it's a product of, of two, 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 two matrices of this form. So we require this uh, matrix of, uh, of variables to be positive semi-definite. And also, I mean, this is, this is kind of an informal what I wrote here. So by this, I mean that you have a bunch of linear inequalities, uh, I mean, linear constraints on the variables that appear in this matrix, right? So 
you have this requirement that is positive semi-definite, and then you can write any linear inequalities on those variables that you that you want. So this is the second uh, the second uh, line. So this is a semi-definite program, and it's kind of I mean a very similar argument shows that that uh, uh, sum of square refutation of degree d exists if we can I mean we we can write down a semi-definite program which is feasible if and only if the the uh, degree d sum of square refutation exists. Okay, so now uh, uh, we've we've shown with uh, with with Albert. Uh, that feasibility of SDPs is expressible in infinitary counting, uh, infinitary counting logic, which means, uh, I mean, a similar, uh, I kind of exactly the same argument shows that this way we can show that the proof search algorithm, I mean, the, the proof search for degree D sum of squares is expressible in, uh, in this infinitary counting logic. And as you remember, the lower bounds all the lower bounds that I showed for fixed point logic with counting were actually lower bounds for this stronger infinitary logic. So even though, I mean, so in particular, I mean, the, 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 uh, the complexity of, of the exact feasibility problem of SDPs is uh, kind of unknown. So we, are, we don't expect it to be in polynomial time. So, so I mean, uh, this, 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 is, this is why we show an ex like this expressibility result needs to be an expressibility result in a much stronger logic. But the lower bounds uh, that apply to FPC will also apply to, I mean, also apply to this logic. So we will be able to to use the same lower bounds to tr to tr translate the same lower bounds into proof complexity lower bounds. Okay, so this is the theorem that I want to tell you a little bit more about. Mm, I think I'm not gonna really uh, this promise of finishing by 3:45 is not gonna be. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, okay, so so this is the theorem that I want to focus on now, and I want to give you a sketch of of the proof. Uh, so before we show this, so this is basically some kind of trick, showing that I mean, this theorem about feasibility of SDPs is some kind of a trick, on top of the theorem which was first showed by Davar and Wang which says that the weak feasibility of explicitly bounded SDPs is expressible in fixed point logic with counting. So this is a problem that is known to be in polynomial time. So in particular, we can hope for it to be in FPC. So what do I mean by weak feasibility of explicitly bounded FPCs, uh, uh, SDPs? So, I mean, this, this uh, talking already about this express expressibility result. So I mean that we can take an encoding of an SDP and two, and then I mean, together with an encoding of two rational numbers, R and epsilon. And such that, so we have to, we have, I mean, the, this, this, uh, this encoding, this SDPK has to be contained in a ball of right radius R around zero, right? So this is what I mean by saying that we only can we can express the feasibility for explicitly bounded SDP. So we know that this this uh, this SDPK is is uh, inside this this ball of radius R. And this the fact that the weak feasibility is expressible in in FPC means that there is a sentence of FPC such that this whole thing. So this is what I call A, the structure A. So this is the encoding of an SDP, an encoding of R, and an encoding of epsilon. So this structure satisfies this, this sentence phi. I mean, if, if the structure satisfies phi, then we know that the SDP is non-empty. On the other hand, if the structure does not satisfy phi, then we only know that the volume of, the, of this SDP is small. But we don't know, I mean, we don't know that it's empty. We just know that it's, it's, it's small. So actually, more precisely, this, this uh, this gives us witnesses for for both those. Uh, I mean, I, I I simplify a bit. So actually, this this we can get more. We can define witnesses for both of those, uh, both for k being non-empty and for its volume being uh, being small. This so, fact that the SDP is contained in this ball of radius r, or whatever that means, that's like a, a promise, or is that something you can verify, or just we're operating under the assumption that this is true? We are operating under the assumption that this is true. Uh, yeah. So, um, 
Yes. So in particular, one thing which is which is important about this weak feasibility of explicitly bounded SDPs is that if the if the if the SDPK is not full dimensional, right? So it's if it's in, included in some hyperplane in our in our space, then the fact then its volume is zero. So then this 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 fact that its volume is small basically does not tell us anything. So this is why this this I mean I mean in general we can we can express I mean we can express the thing that uh, I mean it's exactly as I say here, but one important thing to to kind of see here is that this makes this this procedure kind of tells us something, but only for for SDPs which not only are explicitly bounded, but also are full dimensional. So that this volume being small actually means that the set itself is small and not uh, yeah not some huge thing just. In, included in some hyperplane, but this is just a comment. This is not. Um, I mean, this is not something that we assume here. Um, okay, so. Can I? So, ask mm -hmm. yes, of course. Uh, um, so I'm just trying to understand uh, if I think about this K as a convex body rather than. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe two questions. Is there, I'm not sure if you thought about it, is there some natural way to encode the convex body in this language? And is there, so, and if there is, does this work? Yeah, so uh, in some sense it does work. So what we actually, uh, so, so I mean, this, this, this theorem about SDPs is, uh, is due to uh, the Warren Wang. But uh, with Albert, we actually generalized their construction to arbitrary, um, explicitly bounded, uh, closed convex sets in the sense that we showed that uh, there is an FPC reduction from the, the weak feasibility problem to the separation problem. But so, so this means that in some sense, whatever class of uh, closed convex sets you want to consider, but then you have to, con I, mean, in, I mean, I don't think that there is a way of representing any convex body. I think that you would have to think about, I mean, you would have to think about some concrete class of convex sets and then uh, kind of come up with a representation for those. But you can somehow apply this this theorem that uh, that we that we get to any class of uh, of convex closed convex sets. So then, if you show that you can you can express in fixed point logic with counting or I mean any other logic, if you can express the weak separation problem, which is somehow perhaps in some sense easier. I mean, it in at least for SDPs and LPs, it's it's kind of easier to 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 express. Uh, then you know that the, the weak feasibility problem can also be expressed in FPC because there is an FPC reduction from one to the other. But uh, yeah, somehow you, I think that you would have to make it, uh, you would have to make it more precise, but the reduction works since kind of, as, as I will discuss in a moment, since the ellipsoid method actually takes as, does not take as input the representation of the set. It only has access to the set via the separation the separation oracle because of this we can express in fpc this this reduction to to the separation oracle we can express it uh, somehow uh, independently of the representation of the set itself it's only the oracle the separation oracle which has to take uh, as input the representation so that's why uh, yeah so in in some sense, on a very like kind of a, on a high level, the reduction works. But then I think that in order to have a precise statement, weak feasibility for some class of explicitly bounded uh, convex uh, bodies is expressible in FPC. You would have to make this more precise and come up with some concrete uh, class with a concrete representation. Yeah. So uh, okay, thanks. That's a that's that's a very good question. Okay, so yeah, so again, so so to um, to show this theorem, what we actually do is we implement well, in some sense, we implement 
in fixed point logic with counting. So we implement choicelessly the so-called central cut ellipsoid method. So what is the central cut ellipsoid method? It takes as input. So this is this is exactly this point where where I mean the central cut ellipsoid method does not take take as input the representation of the convex set. This is this is why uh, what we just discussed worked. So uh, works. So it takes as input epsilon r and n, where those are some uh, those are some um, uh, rational numbers, and this is a natural number given in unary. It has an oracle x access to a convex body in, in the sense that it can make calls to weak separation oracle for some SDP. I mean, in this in this in this case, we are talking about SDPs to uh, to so some weak separation oracle for SDP k, where k is included. So again, we need k to be explicitly bounded. So k is included in this ball of radius r. And I mean, here there is a theorem. It runs so it's a polynomial time oracle algorithm which outputs one if the SDP k is empty and zero if its volume is smaller than epsilon, at, at most epsilon. So this is the this is the algorithm which we implement in FPC. We also show that weak separation oracle for SDPs is in, can be expressed in in FPC, which all together gives us an FPC. I mean an algorithm. I mean FPC formula uh, or FPC algorithm which solves the weak. So so I mean here we I mean this this. Uh, the output, uh, I mean, the output here is, is exactly the solution to the weak feasibility problem. Okay, so this is uh, so this is our goal. Uh, uh, okay, so now uh, what is uh, the just this to to so that we fully understand uh, this part? So what is this weak separation oracle? What is the weak separation problem? So the weak separation problem takes us input. Uh, I mean, some, some, con I mean, an SDP, let's say, uh, a vector in the same space and some uh, rational number, uh, some positive rational number, and outputs a bit and a vector of, uh, I mean, let's say infinity norm one. And uh, what, we, what we require is that if we answer, let's say, yes, then we assert that the uh, that the point y is contained in a delta ball around k. So this is why it's weak. So normally we would want to say yes if if uh, if the if y is inside k and no otherwise, and also give a separation hyperplane. But since it's since it's a weak separation oracle, we say yes if y is in some ball around k. And we say no, and output. So uh, we output some non-zero vector s. So we output uh, this s and say no if the if this this hyperplane, which is defined by the vector s, kind of almost separates k from s. So I didn't write the exact inequality, but uh, I mean I, I guess it's uh, it's kind of clear uh, what it means. So we get an almost separate like a separation oracle, but not quite. Uh, separation hyperplane, but not, but not not quite. So this is the this is the weak separation problem, and uh, what uh, and and one thing that that needs to be shown here is that this weak separation problem for SDPs is definable in FPC. But this is this is somehow uh, I mean, of course this is not uh, super easy, but uh, but yeah, but this is kind of easier than the, the other idea, and I think that the the idea in the in the the reduction is kind of uh, yeah, it's it's kind of uh, smarter in some sense. Um, okay, so we kind of know that this part of the 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 oracle calls can be done in FPC. So now, uh, what do we do with the rest of the algorithm? So now, once we when we run this ellipsoid method, whenever we do we make an oracle call, we know that this can be done in FPC. So now, how do we encode the ellipsoid method? So basically. In some sense, we now want to use this ellipsoid method as a black black box black box algorithm, and uh, and uh, argue how we can implement it in FPC 
using, uh, using some facts about FPC that I showed you before. Okay, so what happens? So our, uh, our uh, kind of our formula will take as input an SDP, which, which is uh, contained in R to the I. I is an unordered set. So you remember when I was talking about uh, how we encode systems of linear inequalities as structures, the, 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 I mean, the constraints and the variables were indexed by an R unordered set. So K is a, is a subset of R to the I, and I is some unordered set in our representation as a structure, it will be an unordered set. So we take this K, we take R, and we know that K is in, included in a ball of radius R. And we have this epsilon, which I mean, this epsilon, which is which comes from the, the fact that we are deciding the weak visibility. Okay, so first we take the epsilon, the R, and the set I. So remember that the central cut ellipsoid method, it doesn't take, it does not take as input the SDP, the it takes as input just epsilon, R, and I, which comes from here. And now it's gonna uh, become a little bit, so now I just want to give you kind of a high level idea of what happens. So first we defined, I will tell you a bit more precisely what I mean by this, but we define an ordered version of the problem. So the problem, so, so the, the issue with implementing P time algorithms in FPC is that if we don't have the order, then it becomes tricky. So we define in some, some way an ordered version of the problem and start running the ellipsoid algorithm. So, I mean, since, the, since now everything is ordered, we can just start running the ellipsoid algorithm and we know that we will be able to implement, since it's, it's running in polynomial time, we will be able to implement all the steps in polynomial time. So we start running the algorithm and implement it in polynomial time. So this is uh, due to this Immerman-Vardy theorem that I talked about in the first part of my talk. Then at some point we are given some Oracle query. So we are given a vector and some, uh, and some rational number. And we are, I mean, we are so, so, so that the, the convex body, uh, I mean, yeah. So, so the Oracle query is supposed to be for an, for an, uh, for a separation uh, Oracle 4K. So instead of so so once we are we have this well once the algorithm makes this make this makes this oracle query we replace it by the FPC formula that we know that exists so the FPC formula which takes our original SDPK some modified y so here we have y here we take some modified y and the same parameter delta. And uh, well, we, we ask, we just ask this query, this, this Oracle query. And now we look at what the Oracle, what the Oracle answers. So if the Oracle says that this modified Y belongs to the ball around K, then we can immediately say, okay, so this means that K is non-empty. If K would be empty, then we would never find uh, any point which is, uh, which is in a ball around K, right? So that's it. We are we are we are done. We can just uh, output one and and assert that our original k is non-empty. So what happens otherwise? Otherwise, we have some kind of we we are we we get some like almost separating our hyperplane in the form of a vector s. So there are two two uh, two possibilities. Either the vector s that the oracle outputs respects this order that we introduced in some way at the beginning. So then we can basically take it as our as answer to our Oracle query and go on. The other option, so I will I will kind of I will get into the details of this, but uh, but somehow so so this isn't very much not clear what it means that it respects this order that we defined at the beginning, but it will become clearer at the like in a moment. So either it respects the answer of the Oracle respects the order that we defined so far, and then we can move on and kind of, uh, yeah, we, we, we just move, continue. Or if it does not respect the order, then we can use this vector in an output to refine the order and start from the very beginning. And at the end, we basically, so we basically run this procedure and 
uh, if if uh, uh, if at no point, like I mean, there is like in the, like all the time there is an option that we will find something in K. So if in the in the process of running of this algorithm we find some point in with K and in K, so if the if the separation uh, if the separation oracle asserts that K is non-empty, then in the process of running the algorithm we will output one at some point, and if if it never happens, then we output zero and assert that the volume of the of the SDP is smaller and equal than epsilon. But basically, the key idea here is that we, we during the run of the ellipsoid algorithm, so we don't really care what it what it does because we know that it runs in polynomial time. So if our input on which we run it is ordered, then we know that we can implement whatever happens in fixed point logic with counting. And then we use the answers for the, uh, that, that are given to us by the calls to the, to the separation oracle to either, I mean, either those answers agree with our ordered version of the problem, and then we can run to the, the I mean, we can basically, we can even finish and, and, uh, and just answer the question. So of course we can, we have to prove that the answer to the ordered version corresponds to the answer to the unordered version. And I mean, there are several things here that have to be proved, that have to be proved, but either everything, all the Oracle calls kind of agree with our idea, I mean, with our ordered version of the problem, and then we can just finish the computation or during the run of the algorithm, at some point, the answer to the Oracle call will not agree with what we think is, is true. And, but then we can use this answer to refine the order and continue. So by, so by the way, since somehow we are, we are talking about an order, so, so I, will, I will just uh, give you a little bit more details in a second about this order. But when I talk about an, the order, I'm talking about the order defined on this set of indices i. So in particular, we cannot refine the order indefinitely. I mean, uh, we refine it, refine it, refine it. At some point, in the I mean, in the worst case, we will finally arrive at an order. I mean, the 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 the, the, the i will be totally ordered, and then we are absolutely sure that we can implement everything in FPC because this means that our structure is totally ordered, and and that's it. We can just uh, apply the immerman vardy theorem. Okay. So I want to tell you just uh, a little bit more about what I mean by this order, but maybe there are, I mean, this was kind of a high level idea. So maybe there are some questions as, at this point. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so so just uh, I mean basically I have uh, one more thing to 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 finish this uh, to finish this part. So what I mean by this ordered version? So here the the idea is called folding. So we at at any point in the during the run of the algorithm, we have some function sigma from the set i. I mean, this is basically the set of variables from the set i of variables to an ordered set uh, one to the k. So this defines a quasi order, or I don't know how it's called exactly, a quasi order on on i. At the beginning, we start with k equal one. So we basically put. So I mean, we can also think about it as an equivalence relation. I mean, an ordered. I mean, just an order on equivalence classes, right? So in the at the at first I mean at the very beginning of the run of the algorithm we just put everything in one equivalence class, and now so we will we will start with this one equivalence class and then we will refine this, and whenever we have this sigma so at every any point we have some sigma, and based on the sigma we can define two operations folding and unfolding, so folding takes a vector in our original space and maps it to the vector in R to the K, where K is uh, ordered. So I, I just, I mean, I didn't write the, 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 the formula, I just wrote an example. So let's say that this is our, our vector in the original space. And let's say that this is our sigma. So sigma maps those two guys to one and those three guys to two. So we just take an average 
I mean, the, 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 the folding just takes an average. So we take an average of the first two components and then the average of the components uh, three, four, and five. So of course, I mean, this, this is an easy example because I put them I mean, the first two in the one equivalence class and the second three, I mean, then the, of course it could go like, I mean, you know, the first and last could be in the same equivalence class and so, so on, but this is the folding operation. And then unfolding just duplicates the values. So unfolding is supposed to take an, or, uh, a vector here and output a vector here. And then just, uh, I mean, it just to duplicate the, the, the values of, of this vector. So this is unfolding. So now, um, yeah, so now getting back to what's happening. So suppose that Sigma defines the current order. So it's it's not a total order. It's just, it's like a, it's, it's equivalence class plus order on the, it's equivalence classes in some equivalence relation plus, plus order on those equivalence classes. So we kind of think that we are running the algorithm for folded. So, so K is our, our uh, semi-definite set and, and K sigma, this is just a set of vectors uh, of, of K to which we apply sigma. So this is the folded version of K. So in our kind of, we are thinking that we are running the algorithm for this folded version of our problem. And uh, well, together with uh, actually the parameter R does not have to change and the parameter epsilon has to change. I mean, of course there is kind of quite a lot of uh, tedious calculations about uh, you have to choose carefully the parameters. Now, so we, we kind of, we run the algorithm uh, having in mind that we are actually running it for the folded version of our SDP. Then given a, an Oracle query, so the Oracle query, I mean, you know, the, 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 the ellipsoid method actually does not have access to this again, right? I mean, this is important. So it gives you, an, gives, it gives us an Oracle query. So this Oracle query comes from, it gives you a vector Y, which belongs to Q to the, to the, to the K. Now, this is important and some, some, some Delta. We replace it by, and this is important. So this is, this is, this is the, the place where we kind of could detect a conflict between our belief that we are running it for this set and actually, you know, like uh, the fact that we, we have the K. So instead of, of an Oracle query for this set, which we don't even know which, whether it's SDP or not, and some, and some other things, we replace it by the, by the Oracle query for K, unfolded Y and uh, Delta. So, I mean, it can happen that the unfolded Y actually belongs to the ball around K, which means that K is non-empty and then we are done. If it's not the case, then we output some vector at S. If S respects our current Sigma, meaning that for instance, so this is what I mean by respecting is that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the same here and the same here, right? I mean, I hope that this is kind of clear. If it respects the current Sigma, then we can, we can fold it. We can, sorry, we can unfold it. Uh, no, we can fold it <laughs> and take a uh, B and fold it S as an answer and continue, right? Because this will be, this, this means that uh, uh, the folded version will be one, three, right? And we can continue. And we show that this actually will kind of be a correct answer to the Oracle query for this set. And if S does not re uh, respect Sigma, so for instance, S is of this form, one, one, two, three, three. So here we have inside of this equivalence class, we have different values. Then we can use this S to refine the order. So new order will assign well, those two guys will be still mapped to one, but here there are different values. So, I mean, this value is smaller than those values. So we can, we can split it into two equivalence classes. And also since we have order, I mean, since, since this is order, this is two and this is three. And we know that those are those, those numbers, we know that two is smaller than three. Then we can also order those two equivalence classes by saying, okay, so this is now gonna be mapped to two and this is gonna be mapped to three. Okay, so uh, so that's it, and uh, so that's it for the for the uh, for this theorem. Uh, yeah, so this is this is just uh, I mean I, I put again this this theorem that we have just uh, just proven. I uh, I mean.
I think that maybe I will I will just uh, take uh, questions if there are any questions for this and uh, I think we're running over time so I don't know if uh, if it makes sense to uh, to get into the details of the of the exact feasibility so maybe I can just uh, I mean I can just jump to a few applications but those are just uh, this is just a few uh, statements so uh, no more technical details um, okay but first maybe there are some questions about uh, about the proof of this uh, this theorem and this implementation of the ellipsoid method. Uh, okay, I will have a, some question. So you use the L infinity norm. This just mm -hmm. helps in the calculation of the last pay uh, on the last page that you showed us. Uh, no, this L, L, this L infinity norm is, uh, I mean, it's basically, uh, I mean, I think it's just important. I mean, perhaps it's important in the calculations of the parameters, but, uh, but I don't think it's, it's even key. I mean, you just have to, I mean, you have to have a vector which is non-zero and then I, I don't even know if it matters that we, we talk about the, L infinity norm, whether we couldn't maybe fix some other norm to be one. Uh, I don't, I, I don't remember. I mean, I don't remember where it's where it's important, but uh, but I don't think it's it's crucial here. Yeah, the, all the norms are are equivalent, but just in the work in the calculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Meaningful, I guess, but maybe. There is yeah, I, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think it's cr it's crucial that we are, I, I think that this is, I mean, the, the L infinity norm, I think it's just, uh, I mean, it's it's just, uh, I mean, we, we take this this algorithm straight from the from the, the, the book and, <laughs> ah, yes. and, and I think that they use the L infinity norm and uh, yeah, so this is why we, we do this, but uh, I don't think this is, this would be important here, using this norm instead of some other. I mean, I, I, I'm because I did not uh, actually I did not go through the details of the implementation of the separation oracle, perhaps because you also have to I mean for this for for all of this to go through you I mean for the yeah you have to also implement the, the separation oracle in FPC so perhaps there it kind of helps that this is the infinity norm but I I but I I did not uh, I mean uh, I I didn't. Uh, remind them I mean I didn't get go through this proof before this talk so I don't remember how we do this uh, uh, yeah in, in details okay so maybe you should yeah skip telling us about yeah. some applications is maybe nice. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so so yeah, this, this is the theorem, and then we uh, so basically okay. So for so maybe just one comment about LPs. So I I said that the, uh, there is this result about feasibility of linear programs being expressible in FPC. So basically this is uh, I mean this 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 was actually showed before. This is just that the ellipsoid method for linear programs solves the, the exact feasibility problems. So, so yeah, so I mean, basically this, this was implemented for LPs before it was implemented for SDPs in, uh, in fixed point logic with counting. Um, yeah, so those are all the consequences. And then, uh, and then, I mean, I'm not gonna show this, but this feasibility, the fact that feasibility of SDPs is expressible in, in this infinitary logic, I mean, we need to, uh, I mean, we basically need to Define some 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 version which is which is explicitly bounded and full dimensional, and then we use the fact that uh, we have those infinite uh, conjunctions and disjunctions in in fixed point in in uh, in, in, in infinitary logic to somehow implement the the quantification. So uh, so an SDP is non-empty if and only if there exists an R such that for every epsilon, kind of an bounded version of the problem and slightly uh, kind of epsilon the epsilon big epsilon ball up around the bounded version of the problem is is non-empty and this can be expressed uh, using the the extra power that is given to us by the by the um, infinitary logic um, okay so this is uh, this is i mean basically i discussed it before 
so now just, I mean, this is just a few statements of, of, of theorems. So uh, with Albert, we use this expressibility of uh, exact feasibility in infinitary counting logic to show that for the graph isomorphism problem, uh, the Shirley Adams polynomial calculus and sum of squares proof systems are equally powerful. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I kind of discussed it during the, the talk at, at Simon's. So, uh, so maybe some of you have seen this. Uh, so then this is, I, I repeat here the, the theorem by Saifira Immerman, and this can uh, clearly be used. I mean, once we have this expressibility of proof search, we can immediately conclude from this that the graph isomorphism problem requires linear number of variables to refute in sum of squares. So this has been showed by, I mean, actually, this is two, import, uh, two, two independent papers by O'Donnell and co-authors and the note T and co-authors in both in like around 2014. So they showed it, I mean, they used different methods to show this and this was actually quite a lot of work. And once we have this proof search, uh, I mean, once we know that proof search is expressible in this infinitary counting logic for uh, for bounded degree uh, uh, SOS, then this is, uh, this is basically uh, immediate. And uh, and finally, I just wanted to mention. So this is actually this this uh, this fact about uh, about CSPs. It's uh, I mean you have to put together a few results. I mean a few complicated results that uh, that have been shown also uh, during the years. But uh, but we can we have some kind of we can also conclude that we have some kind of a dichotomy of co for constraint satisfaction problems. So the ones that are of bounded width can be refuted in constant degree Shirley Adams. And the ones that are of unbounded width, whatever this, this means, require degree uh, linear in N to refute in sum of squares. So, so this is kind of an immediate consequence. Using this proof, the, the expressibility of the proof search is an immediate consequence, but of kind of uh, complicated uh, results in the theory of CSP. So I, yeah. Uh, and then like some versions of this problem has been, I mean, has been published, but not exactly in this in this form. So that's why I don't give references, but it has been shown, but also using different different techniques than uh, than than this. Um, okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry that I didn't. I mean, I promised to finish half an hour ago, but yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And of course, if there are more questions, then uh, I'm happy to to answer. First of all, let me thank you. I on behalf of everybody, uh, giving a brief round of applause. Uh, this was wonderful to see. I mean, these are, you know, looking at this from the outside, there's a lot of wonder and mystery happening over on the logic side and then suddenly, boom, you have these extremely strong consequences. So I, like, I don't, so like one question is, okay, where to go from here? Like, what would you, if you, if one wants to explore these connections further, like what, what uh, potential do you see? I mean, I think that um, mostly what is kind of unfortunate is that, uh, that uh, basically all the consequences that I showed you were, were, I mean, those are theorems that have already been proved using, uh, I mean, using different techniques before we understood the connections and before we could derive them as immediate consequences of some uh, of some facts that hold uh, that we know from finite model theory. So I think that this is uh, this is somehow unfortunate. So I, I mean, I think that uh, what would be nice is to try to implement the proof search algorithm for some proof systems for which we still don't know lower bounds. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So. Uh, and then, I mean, there there are some ideas in those in those proofs that uh, that I, I presented here. And I mean, of course, could be that there there need to be some other ideas. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so I, I I would say that this is this is uh, this would be a natural uh, challenge. So to finally, uh, you know, like uh, <laughs> use this use those kind of connections to 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 answer some questions which have not already been answered uh, using different techniques. <laughs> But yeah, so, yeah, yeah, but some kind of uh, yeah, Lovash River, uh, yeah, I don't know. 
I mean, even if uh, you could make the argument that even if if you proved some results by sort of ad hoc methods, then this is sort of uncovering in some sense why these theorems are true, maybe in some sense. I mean, yeah, you can make yeah, that yeah, 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 of course. I mean, uh, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's that's true. And in some sense, I mean, uh, this uh, this kind of I think that this kind of results so, so it's, it's to some extent it's a bit similar to this work that we have with Albert about CSP that we kind of shown that that there is like we you can think about also about uh, well defined class of reductions which preserve the lower bounds in some sense so here you I mean you also have like I mean now like you know you, you can use first order reductions to to translate lower bounds from one problem to the other because yeah, so I think that this this somehow maybe gives a more complete picture, but uh, but still, I mean, yeah, to me, uh, the, the 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 kind of more 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 most interesting challenge would be to 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 apply this to some problems that uh, yeah, that have not already been been solved. <laughs> I think this would be also a, a, the best way of advertising this uh, this kind those kind of techniques because I, I mean I think that there is not so many people who are aware of those those techniques and uh, yeah if, if if we could uh, solve something new then uh, then maybe this would be uh, yeah good publicity. <laughs> Uh, I, I had uh, a question. So, so somehow all these results seem to be motivated by we we take results from logic and then we get application in proof complexity. And mm -hmm. is it possible or conceivable that the reverse would work? And if so, what would be problems that people would be interested in? Mm, I think that it's uh, so so for instance this work so I, I briefly mentioned this this work of uh, of uh, Groe, Gredel, uh, Pago and Pakusa who kind of established uh, correspondence in both ways so yeah so we have some results of this form which uh, which then could translate uh, some results from proof complexity to uh, to results in finite model theory but I think that at least for now the the um, this tight correspondence is established for very uh, very weak proof systems and weak logics for which we kind of know a lot of lower bounds so this in this sense i think that if we could if we could uh, establish this kind of i mean if we could come up with a logic which would uh, which would kind of uh, precisely correspond to, for instance, sum of squares of, of bounded degree, let's say, then I think that this could have uh, this could have some interesting consequences also on the logical side. So I think that uh, actually, I, I even think that uh, during his talk at, at Simon's uh, Benedict Pagos, so one of the authors of this of this um, of this paper that I mentioned, he, he said that he he wanted to uh, he was looking for somehow a proof system that would correspond. So there are some, so, so I, I mentioned this, this question about logic for p-time. So there are some logics which are candidates for logic for p-time, but we kind of don't know whether they are, uh, I mean, they are inside p-time, but we don't have any lower bounds for them. So this is why they're still candidates for logics for p-time. So perhaps if we could find the proof system which would uh, which would uh, precisely correspond to those logics, then it could be that some uh, some tools in proof complexity could give us lower bounds for those logics. Uh, I mean, disproving the conjecture that those logics, uh, for instance, dis disproving the conjecture that those logics correspond to to p time. So, I think that this direction is also is also interesting. Uh, but yeah, but so far I think that uh, we have uh, this that, exactly. So this 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 close correspondence is for very weak proof systems. So I think it would be tricky to to do it for um, for for strong for stronger logics and stronger proof systems. But uh, I mean, why not? Okay, thanks. This is a bit of self advertising for which I apologize. But there, I think there is one result in the other direction which is mostly due mm -hmm. to my co-author Christoph Berkholz 
uh, which is there's some, I think, a trade off between proof depth and proof width in, in resolution. And then you can combine that with uh, this, um, uh, like a, a substitution technique with overlap that Rasborov developed. And then somehow you can translate this proof complexity trade off to a trade off between, I think, a number of variables and quantifier depth in okay. finite logic. Like you know that if something is expressible with at most k variables, then what's the quantifier depth you need? And, and then like basically you get a proof complexity result that a proof complexity lower bound that translates into a lower bound for mm -hmm, this question. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds, uh, that sounds very interesting. And this is sort of a little bit related also to, to, to Mika's question. I think I, I, I don't like I, I don't have a firm answer that I can that I'm sure about, but I think that for these um, gadgets you had, there's some kind of I think you can get some kind of resolution with you know correspondence between that and the sort of the kind of the duplicator game you're playing. Uh, but I'm very like a hazy on the details, so this is a bit risky to say online. But I think so. Okay, okay but this is this is also like this is kind of worked out in this in this uh, paper of uh... which paper? I mean, be, you because you mentioned you mentioned this 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 trade off. Uh, Result, oh, I think then, the way it is written in the end, we, I don't remember, I think we just translate everything to, to finite model theory. So maybe, okay. yeah, so maybe that's not very helpful. Uh, I, I actually don't remember. I think, I think we sort of, but it's very like the resolution result was there and then you sort of translate it. I think we, uh, if I remember correctly, we give some hints, like actually this is kind of a proof complexity results. Here is how you should think. Okay, but okay, okay. but uh, but the way it is written, like the proof complexity isn't really there. But that was like very clearly where mm -hmm. it came from. Okay, maybe you could uh, send me the reference uh, by email or something. So, uh, yeah, so this is. Would be interested to have. Uh, this what was is this is a Lix two thousand sixteen paper I think Perkholz and Nordstrom. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the title. Quantifier depth, Weisfaller, Lehman, something. I don't remember. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yes. Any other questions? I can ask a question. It's it's not directly somehow related, but it's I was trying to think about it. Um, so this pebbling game um, is in a way similar to uh, notions of dimension that come from learning, learning theory. Okay. Um, in a way, you the the purpose of one of the players is to keep fooling the other person, mm -hmm. and the other person is supposed to catch the <laughs> catch the lie, and and in, and these notions of dimensions are also important in model theory in ways that I'm not sure that I fully understand. So for example, the VC dimension is uh, one of the basic things was proved by Saron Shelach, uh, who does mm -hmm. model theory. Uh, and there are some similar statements for the little stone dimension and things like that. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand if this type of the uh, uh, pebbling game or lower bounds can have some interesting uh, uh, implication in probability theory or like uh, I think maybe like uh, uniform convergence or not some uh, some learning type. 
statement. I'm not sure if it makes complete sense what I mean. I mean, that's, that sounds very interesting, but I think, I mean, I, I know uh, close to nothing about learning theory. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that th this sounds like an, like a very interesting question, but uh, I, I think I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have uh, much to say, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, I guess this is something that could be uh, looked into. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, I think that my uh, knowledge of learning theory is uh, not sufficient. <laughs> to answer this in a meaningful way. So just for the record, I dug up this paper now. So near optimal lower bounds on quantifier depth and vice filer Lehmann refinement steps. I put uh, links in the chat. So I, I think um, let's thank Joanna again for a wonderful seminar, a wonderful tutorial um, and declare the seminar officially closed.